Peter Ludlow, welcome to the 85th episode of New Human Podcast. Thank you. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, absolutely. Likewise. And from Mexico. I am in Mexico, yes. How are you doing with the pandemic in that part of the world? You know, they seem to have a better handle on it than, than we do in the United States. I mean, like things are, are really tight here. Lots of precautions. Uh, people are following the rules. So you, I actually feel safer here than in the United States. Interesting. How um, I want to talk a little about, well, before that, let's get to the work you've done, the lives you've lived, and what are you mainly focused on now these days? I ask everybody just to establish some kind of a perspective and the context so our audience know where, where your thoughts are coming from. Well, okay, let's start here. Uh, let's start with graduate school. So mm -hmm. in 1979, I moved to New York to go to grad school in philosophy uh, at Columbia University. And um, my thought was I was going to do philosophy of language. And um, I showed up and people were doing strange things. <laughs> like the, the philosophers were doing linguistics. By linguistics, I mean linguistics in the sense of Chomsky's program and generative linguistics. And the linguists in the, in, in the sort of vicinity were doing philosophy. And I thought that was sort of weird. And I was a bit distracted from the program. And I spent a lot of time downtown because it was a very distracting time to be in New York in 1979 when I arrived. Uh, and there was a lot going on and had been going on since like 1977 when you know, punk came and really the birth of rap was in that period. But there was a, a, a movement that was known then, or at least it's known now as no wave, as in N-O, no wave. Uh, and what was going on is that way down in the Lower East Side in Alphabet City, which at the time was completely bombed out, there were these kids, I guess, um, and there were a bunch of musicians that decided they wanted to become filmmakers. And there were a bunch of filmmakers that decided they wanted to become musicians. And so everyone was just doing things they didn't know how to do. And the result was fantastic. So the, the, the best example of this is uh, that there was a band that I really liked called Del Byzantines. Byzantines spelled T-E-E-N-Z. And... Uh, I used to go and watch them a lot, and um, the lead singer slash keyboardist was a guy by the name of Jim Jarmusch, who we now know as a very famous film director. Wow. <laughs> and I, I remember when his first movie came out. It was just a little low-budget thing called Permanent Vacation. This was before his big breakout yeah. movie, which was Stranger Than Paradise, I guess. Right. And, and it just blew my mind. I go, wow, that's like Jim Jarmusch, like my my hero from Del Byzantines. And and then I, it was sort of that where I got it, that these, you know, there were these people, everyone was doing, you know, the, we have these musicians trying to make movies and filmmakers trying to start bands. And, you know, it's not like they were working in a vacuum. They were still surrounded by musicians and filmmakers and all that stuff. And so then I got it. I just said, no, you know what? I really want to, I really want to take a deeper dive into linguistics. Uh, and so I applied to go to MIT and uh, as a visiting scholar in the linguistics program. And I really got into linguistics when I was there. I mean, I asked them to put me in, in housing with linguist, linguists or in an office with linguistics grad students. And at one point, I went and talked to the the, the chair of the linguistics department. I said, I'm really getting into linguistics. I'm thinking about like maybe transferring or like after I get my philosophy PhD, maybe I'll, I'll try and get a linguistics PhD. And, and he like looks at me and goes, well, you're getting a PhD anyway. What do you care? You know how, you know, it doesn't matter what your PhD says. If you want to learn linguistics, learn linguistics. That's it. Mm -hmm. You know, and no one cares. No, one, I mean, linguists don't care. No one cares, you know, if your PhD is in philosophy or whatever, you just do linguistics. And uh, that came as a kind of a revelation to me, and it fueled subsequent work, which was often work that was not in my official area of expertise. So my first job out of grad school was in um, the art of, well, an artificial intelligence group at Honeywell. What year was this? And uh, so let's see, that would have been 1985, 86. Okay. Yeah. 
It was the Intelligent Interface Systems Group at Honeywell. And wow. um, uh, th those are the very early days. Yeah. Of, it was really the second iteration of artificial intelligence. And uh, that was that was sort of interesting. Um, and then uh, I was offered a job in philosophy. M many things happened. I was offered a job in philosophy. I took it. And um, but I retained interest in other things. And one of the very early things I was interested in was what was then becoming the Internet. Right. I mean, it's very early stages. And I, I edited a collection for MIT Press called High Noon on the Electronic Frontier. And that covered a, a number of conceptual issues that were already coming into place. One of set of those issues had to do with crypto anarchy, which I guess is something you want to talk about a little bit, Absolutely. a little bit. And then uh, a few years after that, right around 1999, I assembled the second collection, which was titled Crypto Anarchy, Cyber States, and Pirate Utopias. And while the first collection was very successful, the second one was was not, or at least it was not successful until now, like 20 years later. <laughs> it was it's sort of, it, was, it just... It's Way ahead of its time. Uh, well, I, I don't know if it was <laughs> that or, or what it was. Uh, yeah, I don't know what that was, but really, yeah. So it's 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 very interesting that uh, uh, after all these years, that that project is getting some uptake, and I think a lot of it is fueled by what we see going on with cryptocurrencies and just you know decentralized finance and things like that. And that's been it. I've been, I mean, right now I'm I'm involved in two different projects. One of them is kind of straight philosophical. That's a project where I've been looking at some work that the medieval logicians were doing. And by medieval logicians, I mean people you've probably heard of, like William of Ockham, you know, he of the razor, and Abelard, he of the romance with Heloise. Mm. Um, and uh, they had this really interesting project, which was they, they wanted to take, well, first of all, I mean, pre 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 preface this by saying, you know, there's this myth about medieval logic, which is that they weren't doing anything except singing pians to Aristotle or something. And this is this is a myth that was perpetuated by people like Kant and Wittgenstein, but it's a complete myth. And what these guys were doing is they, they wanted to take Aristotle's logic, expand the scope to cover basically any sort of language that you use, and then they were going to take all of his rules of logic and reduce them down to two basic rules. It was like an incredible project. It's a mind-blowing project. And it, and it ran aground some, I don't know, like 600 years ago because they didn't have the tools to study language with the kind of fine logical deal uh, detail that you need to. But now here we are at the development of lots of work in logic in the 20th century and Chomsky showed how you could apply these tools to natural language. So the idea is that now we have the tools to explore these questions after they've been dormant for 600 years or so. Um, and then the other project is I'm, I'm, I remain very interested in cryptocurrencies and in particular a branch of cryptocurrency that's known as uh, decentralized finance or DeFi, where you basically do all the things that the banking industry and the insurance industry and um, all those things that we consider to be part of serious real world finance, whether you can, the question is whether you can replicate all of those functions in the cryptocurrency space. Yep. It seems like um, the beginning of Bitcoin, which now is how many years ago, like 12 years ago, it, it kind of introduced some kind of a practicality to the philosophical perspective towards decentralization and crypto anarchy and uh, it, it kind of yeah. blew up because of that and the context yeah. kind of evolve with it right i think that's right and i think that goes some ways to explaining why the initial iteration of my book on crypto anarchy didn't go anywhere which right. was there was talk about digital cash in it right uh and there were versions of digital cash available but they had not solved the big puzzle, which is called the double spending problem. And it, it took Satoshi to do that. And it, mm -hmm. it, you know, we, it required a technological breakthrough for it to really be feasible. And, and we have that now. 
Sorry, I just mute my microphone because of these dogs. <laughs> Sometimes it's just... <laughs> oh, I, I didn't even hear them. <laughs> okay, good. Um, how has the definition of linguistics changed from the time that you began up to this day? Because it seems to me that language is becoming such a frontier because different political sides, different philosophical perspectives, they're fighting over how to define certain kind of terms. Let's say, for example, racism. Racism yeah. means something to one side and means something to other sides. And they're fighting with each other that, for example, America is a racist country. No, America is not a racist country, but they're fighting with two complete different definitions of these terms. <laughs> yeah. No, that's exactly right. Actually, I have a I have a book on that that came out a couple of years ago, and it was called Living Words. Um, and it was uh, there's I had some subtitle for it, but now I'm forgetting what the subtitle of my own book was. It was called Living Words. Uh, wow, that's terrible. You don't even remember the title of your own <laughs> book. But anyway, I can tell you what it I can tell you what it says. Please. Uh, so the, so the basic idea is that you don't. You don't really learn a, a language. It's not this thing that you you sort of just take on full stop. But rather, what we do is we build little micro languages together. So right now, you and I and your listeners are constructing a conversation together. We're going to introduce terms. We're going to get to understand each other better. And the idea is that it's what I called in the book, and I presumably this is part of the the, the subtitle is the dynamic lexicon is what I called it. Right. Meaning that word meanings are very malleable. They're living words. And so we have to think of them that way. And then a lot of what we do in a conversation is not I have something to say. I'm going to say it. You're going to hear it. But rather, we're engaged in this process in which we're kind of, we're, we're, we're shaping the meanings of the words that we're going to deploy with each other. So a lot of conversation that takes place is not here's some information. Now you have it. But rather, it's sort of us fine-tuning the words that we're going to use to carry on further conversation. It's almost like lexical grooming that we engage in. And part of all of this is when we get into these cases where we have to argue about the meaning of you know, what's really racism or what's really sexism. What is a woman, for example? You know, Does it include trans women? All of these things uh, are what I, I called in the book lexical warfare. And the idea is, well, what happens? You know, often we're in this position where we are actually litigating what the meaning of a term is going to be. And so uh, uh, there's no easy answers to how to do that. But what I try to do is look for certain norms that govern the right way to do it and the wrong way to do it. And, and hopefully, hopefully we are going to get better or have a better understanding of how to litigate these word meanings, especially when the cost is extremely high. Because basically every ethical issue we engage in is on some level a kind of debate about what a word is supposed to mean. You know, what is a person? You know, um, uh, what is what is terrorism? What is uh, uh, what is freedom? What, what is you know all of these things? Basically, everything you when you look at it, what you're doing is you're you're arguing about what the meaning of the word should be. Now, that doesn't mean any 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 definition is equally good because there are rules that sort of dictate or norms that get, dictate whether we are adjusting the meanings of those words correctly. I mean, Bill Clinton himself said that it depends on what you, uh, what, what is the definition of the it, word. It depends is, on what is. is what is. <laughs> Yeah, I think he was. <laughs> I think he was asking what they meant by the tense of that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it can sound kind of shady. I mean, well, that's the thing. Once you, you know, once you understand that you're going to be negotiating the meanings of terms, then you have to. Then you have to be careful because people can pull some really shady stuff with you, and people do it all the time. I mean, the government is the government. For, well, I don't even mean to pick on the government or the government, but they're always trying to shift the meaning of a term. You know, so now Antifa people are terrorists, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it's always it's always going on. It's like an ongoing battle and you have to stay on your toes. This fluidity of words and terms, this is not a modern phenomena. This must have existed throughout history, right? Yep. 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 But w we are where we are in this warfare that you're talking about 
maybe because this process of litigation has been democratized by the use of different kind of devices that now people have their own voices that can be heard, that it didn't really matter maybe 100 years ago that there were different definitions of racism. The definition that would turn into a status quo was determined and established by a centralized structure of authority that had control over newspapers or different kind of media, and that was the term. But now with these, you know, I, I, I always refer to these that we're like monkeys with machine guns. We don't really know the power of these things, but we're using them for our own biologic, biologically driven intentions. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, it's hard to know exactly what the consequence of new media is going to be for this. For sure, with the advent of television and so forth, in the previous century, you might have thought, oh, wow, this is really great because now we can prop we can discuss alternative meanings. But what you got instead was a, more of a system of control. That is one understanding or one meaning of the term became quasi official. I mean, it's not like we had some something, some academy that was telling us what a word should mean, but because of corporate control of media in the United States, there was a kind of control of what words could mean in accepted media. Now, the, that, that raises the question, now that we're all monkeys with our little computers in our hands, what, what is that going to mean? Is it going to mean we get a, a kind of fract a fractionalization of different word meanings? And that could happen. And what you could get is a, a bunch of people descending into different bubbles where, you know, this cluster in, understands a word like freedom in this way, this cluster understands a word like freedom in a very different way, and now we're just, we're just talking past each other. So the real trick, I mean, it's easy, it's easy to have a unified meaning of what a term is, and it's easy to have little clusters of different meanings. The hard part is getting these clusters to, to find common ground with each other and negotiate what the words ought to mean, right? And that is that is the skill that I think perhaps we have lost somewhere along the way. I mean, I don't know. I mean, any sort of historical story is going to be somewhat fantastical here, but I can imagine an earlier history at an earlier time when, when people got together in the bazaar or whatever, and they're not just negotiating the price for, for spices or whatever, right? Uh, let's say we're on the Silk Road or something and we're negotiating prices, but we're also negotiating word meanings. And, I, and I, I tend to think that there wasn't necessarily set understandings of what a word is supposed to mean, right? But but maybe with the 20th century, we, we began to have those kinds of set understandings. And even now, when we ghettoize each other, ourselves, ghettoize ourselves into different bubbles inside of Facebook, um, I'm not sure that we are uh, addressing important questions about what not just what words mean to us and our friends, but what they ought to mean. Yeah, it was also a matter of documentation of them, too. Right. Uh, the term, the idea that history is written by the victor, that what we are uh, what we are reading is not necessarily what had happened is what has been written down and documented. And the difference right now is that there are uh, this process of documentation or litigation that you're saying it's been democratized. So it's not that. And there is any kind of a singular kind of a foundation because there are different kind of needs, different kind of um, desires, different kind of, you know, people are different. Equality yeah. objectively has no meaning, naturally speaking, at least to me. Equity is a different kind of a story. But the fact that you want to start everything at point zero, uh, um, what are we going to do? Are we going to eventually genetically engineer everybody to start at the uh, same ground with the same kind of, you know, it's just impossible. Right. Impossible. We all start from different places, right? And so given that we're starting from different places, you know, how do we engage with each other and create, in my terminology, micro languages with each other so that we can communicate, even though we begin from different starting places. And you, you mentioned a point earlier where, you know, in the, when we look back historically, we often don't really understand how variegated language was and, and the, all the different forms in which it, it could be found, you know, ranging from 
how things were written to to the different understandings of word meanings. And hopefully, if nothing else, what the what the internet is going to give us is a vast repository where we're, you know, a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now, we're going to be able to study the different ways in which people were using, were using language in our time. And this depository now is being used for development of artificial intelligence as well, right? And let's think about this context in the big picture of what um, Marshall McLuhan said, that man becomes sex organs of the machines. We're basically feeding the machines to become whatever that they're going to become. And it seems like more and more aspects of our lives are becoming digitized. So this is not a process that's going to reverse at any point. It's just going to accelerate. I mean, it's very interesting to think about what is the nature of the symbiotic relationship we have with the Internet. Um, because it is, it is taking on a big chunk of our cognitive function. I mean, it's, it's onloading lots of our memory. And so you might ask a question. I mean, there's certain philosophers, like a guy named David Chalmers has asked this question. Well, yeah, where extension, exactly is extension yeah, mind yeah, yeah, extended mind, exactly. Yeah. And so, well, where is my mind? Um, well, where's my memory? I mean, that's an easy, you know, because like you asked me a question, I don't, I don't remember the... <laughs> Well, a great example is you asked me the title of my book and I can't remember the subtitle. Well, I can't remember it. I just don't have my phone handy and I don't want to be rude and pick it up. But that's it. I just like offload a bunch of my memory onto onto my telephone or into the Internet. And so so we begin to create this very weird symbiotic relationship with a machine, but not just with our physical bodies, right? But actually our minds are, um, much of our mental processing is being done externally. You know, people always talk about, oh, I wanna get a computer inserted in my head. It, it, it's too late for all that. In effect, that's already, ha you don't have to put it in your head, right? The fact that you're relying on on the internet and on on Google or, or DuckDuckGo or whatever whatever search engine you use, the fact that you're relying on that to to reason and to carry on your cognitive functions shows that 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 fusion of your mind with the internet is to some extent already happened and you don't need to do sci-fi things like implant implant things into your into your head hmm. so you're not on board with uh, elon musk's Neuralink. I, you know, I, I mean, it would be interesting to see what happens. Right. I, I would I would expect something interesting to happen. But in a, but and from a, an engineering problem, it must it'll be really fascinating. But from a philosophical issue, it's almost like, well, yeah, but it's kind of we've already done that in a way, hmm. in the most interesting way at the most philosophical level. It's already happened. One of the argument I, I've talked to a number of people about this. Um, one of the arguments is that in order to find who we are, which is the way to find about the universe and everything else <laughs> to look within inwardly, we yeah. require to develop higher levels of cognition, cognition ability, because we're, we're doing really good compared to monkeys, but you know, we could do way better. Well, whatever the definition of that better is, you know, that's, that's, uh, debatable, but the fact that what we are experiencing is not all there is. We can experience far more, uh, let's say like in matrix kind of an environment. And to get there, we cannot rely on biology and trial and error driven process of evolution. Now that's very arrogant. Some people would say, well, you're playing God and you don't know how uh, this is going to affect and influence your environment and you can mess everything up. But at the same time, it has a spiritual uh, kind of aspect to it too that if I can know more and be more why wouldn't I do it you know I've never been on board with this kind of project um, because I feel that you 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 can change your cognitive makeup right and people think well all right I want to I want there must be a higher plane of reality that I can achieve I could know things better but it's always occurred to me that, you know, you might achieve a, a different way of thinking, but I don't know that it, there's an interesting sense in which it's a higher plane. It's a different plane, right? 
Uh, and you might get there and you might look down at your previous life before you, you enhanced your mind with implants and so forth. And you say, wow, I was really stupid. But I'm not, that's not really evidence that, that you've achieved a higher plane, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, it may be evidence that you, you've achieved a plane of higher hubris or something like that. And the other element to it is I don't, I'm not convinced that, that we are even close to bumping up against natural limits to our own intelligence. Part of that is because I don't think our own intelligence is solely a function of what's going on inside of our heads. And this, is, this brings us back to the business about the extended mind. If our minds, if my mind is in part a function of what's going on in the external world already, and if all these amazing things are happening in the internet and artificial intelligence and big data, and all of those can be construed as part of my mind, but furthermore, there are these methods of communication in which I can communicate and exchange ideas with people like you, right? I am like very rapidly achieving like higher and higher, I don't know if planes of consciousness is the right word, but but certainly I'm, I'm learning a lot more and thinking in ways that I couldn't imagine thinking earlier, right? So, so uh, to me that there are these these avenues of sort of naturally growing that are much more interesting to me than, than to try and find some sort of imaginary wall to our intelligence or some sort of ceiling to our intelligence is a better way to put it, which if we could break through that, then we could see the world correctly. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's very oh, cool. interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. With I mean, I would consider myself a transhumanist in a sense that I, I believe that hu hu humanity and technology, we have evolved together in a sense, the way that uh, Kubrick portrayed it in 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, you know, we found a tool and then we use it in order to obtain things for ourselves and then protecting those things against a different tribe. And then different tribe looked at us and they improved that tool a little bit. And now we have International Space Station and the reusable rockets and all that. But you're absolutely, I think, spot on with saying that we haven't even tapped into the full potential of our own cognition and ability, and we cannot really no um, make the claim otherwise when we have a um, variety of psychedelics, completely illegal, and, hey, you cannot do that, don't you dare doing that, and this is an interesting oh. time we're talking about it because it's the yeah. second revolution of psychedelics that are happening right now. If really we're in the second revolution of, well, you know, it's funny you say that because like, as I'm like living in Mexico now. And so, I mean, there are a lot of people that are experimenting with psychedelics and have, but they have been for, you know, a, a, a thousand years, like the huicho with the peyote and so forth. Yeah. Or if you go down to Brazil, the, uh, lots of tribes. And I mean, I have an, I, you know, I actually have thoughts about psychedelics and their history with people, which is that um, to some extent, the human mind evolved to not really function that well it, uh, on its own, like in isolation, but, but we evolved to be able to function with the help of the things we find around us. And in some sense, that might be magic mushrooms or whatever the case might be. Are talking about stoned so, ape theory? Is that, what's that? I don't know that theory. What the stone day? Oh, well, I, there's no doubt in my mind that, that like almost every animal on the planet has a way of managing its, its mental health with the help of, with the help of, of some form of drug, you know, from reindeers with their little red cap mushrooms to, to uh, really, is there a, is there an actual theory with the name about stone apes? Yeah, Terence McKenna, Terence McKenna's uh, theory, stone ape theory, yeah, is that we basically it. our brain evolved faster than the rest of our body because we started experimenting with psychedelics. I would say that we co-evolved with these substances. Okay, so I don't know. I mean, if you went back to early, early history, I, I believe we actually co-evolved with some of these substances. And there, we can find them around on planet Earth right now because early human ancestors found them useful. And so to function correctly cognitively, we needed these plants. We don't need now. We can go, you know, we have big pharma that can help us, I suppose. But, but you know, if you try and 
here, here again, we get into this issue of the externalization of the human mind, right? It's not just what's in here, yeah. and it's not just what we can connect with the internet. But once you start passing laws that prohibit people from using these substances, like peyote or whatever it might be, in a certain sense, you're you're passing laws that are walling off parts of people's very own minds, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah, I'm saying this is a second. Um, I mean, it's it's well established that we're going through a second uh, psychedelic revolution because of organizations like MAPS, which is a multidisciplinary multidisciplinary association with psychedelic studies that they're pushing to legalize MDMA, for example, to deal with depression uh -huh. and PTSD. For because there are more, for example, veterans are dying inside the United States that they are dying uh, in the battlefield. And a lot yep. of them get hooked on like opioids yeah. and stuff, but then they do like two sessions of ayahuasca and, you know, it does magic, for example, for them. Interesting. Yeah. It's like Interesting. Kind of becoming a moral I, uh, kind of argument. Yeah. I mean, I'm not any sort of expert on this and I'm, I'm not, I mean, I have my own way of managing my mental life, which involves a lot of time and the internet and with computers and so forth and gaming. But uh, it's very clear to me that there are people that really need these substances and access to them, and 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 it's critical. It's a critical part of their mental lives. And yeah. It's 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 just alien to deny that to people. Absolutely. It's like saying, well, you can't use this part of your brain. Yeah. Or explore it. <laughs> yeah. Or explore it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so, but coming back to your point, I mean, yeah. So these are. I don't think of them as, as even tools. I think they are these 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 substances, these natural substances are parts, critical parts of our mental lives. And so, uh, obviously, if you deny yourself those elements to your mental life, you're going to set up certain limits to what you can and cannot think. Um, and and you start you start placing you start placing limits on on your mental life. And that's when people start asking for things like, you know, oh, I want, I want implants or something like that. You don't need implants. You just, you just need the things that are already there. And that's going to open up vistas that are so vast. I mean, we can't even begin to, we can't even begin to quantify the vastness of, of, of the spaces that are already available to us. I think the bridge that connects what we were talking about to back to the digital world and cyberspace, and I want to talk about crypto anarchy, it, it really comes down to individual liberty, that you, you will be able to determine who you are and what you're going to do with that information or data or whatever that determines you, that you represent in a cyberspace, for example. And um, I want to ask you about what is happening to the concept of individuality in the digital realm or cyberspace or metaverse and whether or not crypto anarchy from your perspective is the soul and i would argue that it should be decentralized crypto anarchy right because yeah. i know that anarchy yeah, yeah. philosophically means that it's decentralized but it, it, it seems like for humans you have to emphasize on key terms decentralized yeah. crypto anarchy is the only way and only avenue in order to uh, protect the sense of individuality, however it's going to be defined based on our evolution. Let me say that I am a bit concerned about all the talk of individualism that mm. we get in, in, in the crypto sphere, because there's, it's onboarded a lot of libertarian talk. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure that many of your listeners are libertarians and, yes. I have issues with libertarianism and talk of individualism, and I would much rather frame all of this in terms of, well, like, you know, limits on what we could think, right, using mm -hmm. a plural pronoun there, like, you know, what we can do, what we could think. Um, and I don't, I, 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 I think it's more helpful to think about what crypto anarchy opens up to us in terms of possibilities for collab co collaboration mm -hmm. that otherwise couldn't happen because it's it has to be in certain cases it has to be hidden from maybe from the state but the state is not the only problem here it might have to be hidden from society as a whole because of certain um 
negative attitudes that society has to the ideas that you're exchanging, right? So for me, it's... It's crypto anarchy doesn't really open up a space for me to be me and I can do whatever the hell I want and I can think whatever I want, but it's more like it's opening up a space for us to engage in collective activities that we otherwise not have been able to do. And that's going to benefit me because it's not just me sitting here in a vacuum, but when I'm engaging with other people who now have this freedom as well, the freedom to 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 negotiate new meanings of terms freely together right then that's that's another that opens up another canvas for us to explore right another unlimited canvas or at least a very vast canvas that's going to open up to us and allow us to explore so individualism i'd, I'd rather use a, a term like freedom and that would include not just individual freedom but collective freedom or or community freedom um family freedom you know it's, freedom it of association be, maybe would be a good term, umbrella what, term. What, freedom of association? Um, not just freedom of association, but I mean, there's more to it than that. Because if if we have, I mean, freedom to associate is key, right? And I mean, the internet allows us to associate from across distances. Uh, and what crypto anarchy does is allows people to associate with us that might not otherwise be able to, right? Because their government might not even think they should be online. So they have to find other ways of getting online. I mean, they might have to use Tor or something to, to not be spied on when they're online talking with us. And then once, and so that freedom, as you say, freedom of association is critical, but then once we, once we get there, we also have other freedoms. We have these freedoms to exchange these ideas once we're associating. And we have the freedom to, um, to, to not just associate, but to work together and to, and to, and to keep modifying or mo I like the word modulate to modulate word meanings with each other. And that's key too. That is that language should not be a prison to us, but now language is going to be something that we can, that, that's going to work for us instead of us working inside of a little cage that language has provided for us. And getting together with other people is the first step to that, right? Because mm -hmm. if you're alone or with, you're with the same group of people all the time, then, then you don't have those options. It's not going to be obvious how you should be expanding your language. But once you once you have the opportunity to sort of interact with with people in other places, people from other cultures, people with different ideas and different different micro languages, that's when things really start to happen. This relationship between language and us that you're saying that we're reverting it in a way that language will work for us rather than we work for the pre-established. Yeah. There are people who are benefiting from those pre-existed definition yeah. of language yes, they are yes they are yes uh, yeah maybe government is yeah. uh, one of the best example of them churches are another one government. education system i mean people will make the case that patriarchy people will say that you know you and i benefit because of the sort of the patriarchal right. nature of language and so there's a kind of sexism built into language itself and then there is this project which is what they would call I think the, the fancy word that philosophers use is conceptual ameliorization. But what they mean is we're going to, we want to change the, we, these, the people have imposed these word meanings on us and they're not helpful. And what we have to do is sort of break these definitions or bend the definitions because we can't make any progress until we do that. So yeah, basically in any sphere, it's not just government, it could be cultural, it could be religious, right? You know, what is a religious person? What is what is a moral person? Um, people use language to imprison other people. And so a big part of freeing yourself and freeing your family and freeing your friends is to is to resist this. First of all, identify when people are using language to to imprison you. And secondly, finding the tools that allow you to resist it and to make the case for your view of, of how language actually should be shaped. So what's going to happen to those benefactors of this language prison in the coming years as you know, um, information is becoming more and more democratized? 
Yeah. Well, they're going to freak out. <laughs> Obviously, they're going to freak out. And you're going to have the, you you can you can see this. I mean, there's going to be a kind of linguistic conservatism. I don't mean that like, you know, Republican versus Democrat, yeah, yeah, yeah. because they could both be conservative. Just hold on to what is. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And they're going to be pounding on tables saying, look, look, I have a dictionary right here. And it says, like, this is what a woman is. It, you know, <clears throat> it can't be a trans person. Now, I'm not making a case that trans women are women. I'm just saying, you know, the minute people open up a dictionary and says that's how, that's how you resolve it, those are the people that are falling back on a conservative sort of definition. And uh, people are going to be saying, you know, this new definition is a degeneracy. <laughs> you're destroying language. This is another one you're going to hear. You're destroying language. Everything is going to fall apart because you're destroying language. And you're not destroying language. You know, you destroy language, you keep it in a prison and you don't let it evolve. Right. I mean, you keep it in a prison. It's like putting a tiger in a cage and just locking it up there and thinking that you are somehow preserving it by doing that. Well, you're not. You have to turn it loose. Mm -hmm. Do you think this point of authority to determine the definition and meanings of language is shifting from human governance and authority to artificial intelligence? I had not thought about that uh certainly artificial intelligence can inform these sorts of decisions what would happen if an ai started telling us that you know you're using the definition of woman wrong or you're using the definition of freedom wrong i don't know i don't the thing is that uh the way i perceive all of this is playing out is that there's certain people are going to come up and try and establish authority to you or establish their their linguistic authority okay and there's a question well does that linguistic authority work here right. um so you know we get stranded on gilligan's island and the professor comes to us and says well no actually a tomato is not a vegetable it's a fruit right Well, okay, maybe he has some knowledge about science there. The question is, is that, is that kind of authority relevant to how we talk about fruits and vegetables? Likewise, if an artificial intelligence came to us and said, well, I have all these reasons for thinking that, you know, uh, a, a woman can't be a trans woman or that, you know, freedom I don't know, had some sort of definition of freedom for us. Says that you have to serve the machine. <laughs> That's true. To be truly free, you have to serve the machine. <laughs> and we're like, and we're like, well, you know, you're a very smart AI, but like, you know, we don't necessarily have to take that on, right? And so it's still, even if there are smarter people out there, you know, we always, it's it's not just our, we we don't merely have the freedom to do this, or we we should have the freedom to do it. We also have the responsibility to say. Well, look, I don't really, I don't know if I, I should onboard your definition just because you're smarter than me, because I have my own reasons for defining words as I do. So maybe, you know, I have my own reasons for saying a tomato is a, veg a vegetable. Uh, and uh, I don't really care what the artificial intelligence thinks about that. So it's still at the end. So I guess my point is at the end of the day, we are going to have to still be responsible for deciding Who, which authorities we're going to accept. And, you know, I, I, I wrote a paper on this. I didn't, actually, I never got around to writing. I gave a talk on this. And I, it's one of my favorite, my favorite things to think about, but I'm just inherently lazy about writing it down for some reason, which is about the issue of when you defer to authority, right? So it's a paper about deference. And, and so when you should defer to someone and when you shouldn't. But deference... Not in like, should I cut my hair or should I, you know, salute a flag or something, but deference, deference to somebody about word meaning, about what a word ought to mean. And um, it's not an easy topic. And so part of, part of the idea I had is that no matter what the authority is, you have to issue a series of challenges to that authority always. It doesn't matter who, even if it's like some cool kid in school, right? that's using a term and you think you should defer to that person about the meaning of a cool 
what a, a meaning of a term like to, suppose the meaning of the term is cool what's cool so there's some guy who looks like arthur franzarel fonzi from happy days and we start we defer to well, why is it because of his haircut is it because of his leather jacket well even a character like richie in happy days at certain points has got a challenge challenge fonzi and so the idea is well when do you challenge these linguistic authorities how do you challenge those linguistic authorities? And this is something that fascinates me because I, I have no idea how it's supposed to work or even how about we go about it. But it's, it's a skill we have to acquire because it's critical because we're being surrounded by all these linguistic authorities. They don't always have our best interests in mind. They don't even have their own best interests in mind. And we have to know when they're like, you know, they're jumping the shark or something and, you, and sort of using a word like cool and correctly. We have to be able to to we 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 need to defer to individuals at certain times like doctors on the meaning of certain medical terms for example but we also have to be in a position where we can challenge them and that is that is an art and i if i had rules for doing that i would tell you what they are but i'm not even sure there are rules i think yeah. it's just some practice yeah exactly i think more information we have more uncertainty we are dealing with and I want to go back to what, what you were saying about New York, that it was a very chaotic kind of an era that people were doing whatever they wanted to do and cool stuff were happening. It seems yeah. like we're going through the same kind of a period right now in a different kind of a way, but that, you know, people have access to devices to express themselves and challenge each other. And we don't, as you said, we don't really know what the rules are, but maybe yeah. there are no rules. And uh, good stuff happen as a consequence along the way, and we just have to learn to notice and realize those har moments of harmony, enjoy them, and just move on. <laughs> yeah, except I agree with that. Except I would say it is never the case that there are no rules. Yeah. Sometimes you think there are no rules, um, but that's when you have to be really careful because that means you're not seeing the rules, right? right? Mm -hmm. Like it's like the the. Uh, you know, the fish in the bowl thinks there's nothing out there, thinks it's completely free because it's just swimming around wherever it wants to go. And that those moments when you think that you're completely free, that's when you need to be most on guard. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What are your thoughts on um, simulation theory? I know I don't understand what these guys are talking about. And some of them are my best friends, honestly, because I, maybe they just are putting it in a way that I don't understand because I, I wouldn't call it simulation theory. Like, meaning, do we live in a simulation? Is that the question? Yeah, simulation you're hypothesis, me? I better yeah. say, not theory. Yeah. I mean, because the thing is, simulations typically don't have the relevant properties uh, of the thing they are simulating. So, for example, if I, I can simulate hurricanes using a computer, but it's not like if I open up the computer, it's, there's going to be lots of wind and rain in there, right? Likewise, I might be able to simulate some anything using artificial intelligence, but but it doesn't mean that that anything like whatever consciousness would be happening in there. I think a better a, a better way to make the same point would be well, what if what if we are synthesizing worlds. So you're, you're not merely simulating them, but you're synthesizing them somehow using, maybe using computers. Maybe you can synthesize a reality using computers or something like that. And at that point, my, my attitude is, well, it, you know, it, it doesn't matter if it's synthetic or non-synthetic and maybe, maybe it's just synthetic worlds all the way down, you know, who knows? Um, so I've never really I, you know, I, I, I've never really been grabbed by by that simulation theory stuff. It's interesting to me because you've written about uh, consciousness as well, right? Uh, very little. I mean, I've read a lot about consciousness, but I've, I've and some of my very best friends write a lot about consciousness. And when they, they give these arguments about zombies and so forth, I, I worry because I think I must be a zombie because I don't know what the, what the missing ingredient is supposed to be, you know. Um, and I've always been suspicious of talks about, you know, philosophers have these fancy words for the that sort of eth ethereal extra secret ingredient X. Sometimes they call them qualia. Sometimes they call it sense data. It's sort of like, well, when you see 
something green, there is this green mental patch that's there it, that exists somehow in your mind in addition to the green thing itself. And I'm never, I've always been a bit suspicious of that. You know, the philosopher Gilbert Ryle talked about this, and, we, and he says, well, you know, people talk about seeing, seeing a mental image with the mind's eye, but, you know, people never talk about smelling mental, mental images of smells with the mind's nose, for example. Like, I'm at, we imagine popcorn, right, the smell of popcorn or buttered popcorn or whatever, and we, but we don't fall into this thing like, oh, there must be this thing that the mind's nose is smelling in my head or something like that. And I think I can't get past the feeling that when we, when we, when we start talking about uh, these sense data or qualia or, or conscious experience stuff, that we aren't inventing something that isn't there. I mean, I guess, I guess Dennett has, Dan Dennett has a, a view that's similar to this. So, I mean, this might be exactly his view. So uh, maybe I'm a Demetian, Dennettian about this. <laughs> um, another interesting way to look at it, I have a guest, I really like having him, Chris Nibar, who is a neuroscientist, but he's also a Taoist. Uh -huh. And his whole thing is that we have a right side mind, left side mind, and all this need to categorize and make sense out of stuff is the product of the left side brain. Uh, the right side is more of a curious, childlike kind of a brain that it doesn't matter what it means. It doesn't matter in what category it fits. It's just that you're experiencing it. So uh, try to make sense out of something with half of our brain. It just means that we're just making sense of uh, maybe half of half of the thing that exists based on our own categorization of it. Yeah, um, that's right. Uh, I think I think you need the interplay of the two things, mm -hmm. right? So that is, uh, you know, this I, I'm immediately thinking of. Con talking about concepts without percepts are empty, percepts without concepts are blind. Yeah. So it's sort of like, and so you need that kind of organizational element or you don't have any experience at all. But then once you get things organized, right, conceptually, perceptually, and so forth, you have to, you have to keep interrogating the conceptual apparatus you've built for yourself. And you have to keep tearing it down and challenging it with, I forget which side, left or right, is going to do that. But I guess that's the the left, the right side of the brain is going to do that. Well, that doesn't matter. Whatever they. So you have, you know, so you need the two. This kind of interplay between the two. Very interesting. You need. You can't. You can't let either side sort of get lazy on you. Yeah. Now, when I talk to Chris, the whole thing is that the West has been dominant by the left side of the brain that, you know, we just make sense out of everything and be convinced that this is it. But it, obviously, we have huge amount of problems here. Uh, it seems like Western cultures and societies have figured the surface really well. But don't you dare look beneath that because we have no answer for it. And you're going to go rogue if you <laughs> if you be curious a little too much about them. <laughs> yeah, no, people get very uncomfortable, right? Because people and myself included, I mean, I like I mean, I don't like it that much, but I, I do take some security when things are neatly organized. And I know and the concepts we're throwing around, we know what we mean and, you know, we know what freedom means. We know what, what a woman is. We know what this and that is. And when those concepts start breaking down, it's a, it's an uncomfortable feeling. And um, it is true that in the West we do get, we do like to lock down concepts, right? Um, you know, it's a very weird thing. I mean, this is, I think this is related, but if it's not, you could say this is not related. But I, I was, at one point I was reading literature from Japanese business schools, uh, just just because I thought it was interesting. And there were the people that were working for 7-Eleven in Japan. And the question was, how do you categorize the things that you have in your store, what you're going to order? What I mean, you think about it, it would never occur to you that that is a puzzle or a problem that needs to be solved, right? But, you know, if you think, say you're in 7-Eleven USA and, you know, these are the things that we're going to keep in our store. 
you're going to be left behind pretty quickly because the fact that we like things neatly organized in this way today, it's no guarantee that, you know, the next generation of people coming along or this crop of immigrants or whatever, or however people are changing, these people using ayahuasca are going to want to is categorize things in the same way. So what, what the business, these business school guys uh, were looking at at um, 7-Eleven Japan and looking at ways in which they maintain fluid categorization of the concepts of the things they were keeping on inventory and the things they were selling and the things they were ordering. And a lot of that involved not just having, you know, it involved having multiple people with different categorizations and throwing those people together. And so that when you have people with very different ideas, I mean, I guess this brings us back to the Lower East Side of New York in 1979. But when you get people with different ideas and different ways of categorizing the world, something new and interesting is going to come out of that. Yeah, Japan is such an, have you been? Yeah, yeah, but not, I mean, I not nearly enough to really be any sort of authority on it yeah yeah i've been once and uh, in like three years ago and all my childhood you know in iran i watched a lot of anime and japan for me was like india for hippies i always yeah. wanted to go and it yeah. did not disappoint and i always yeah. use it as an example of how organically they are adapting to technology like you go to a temple that's been built like thousand years ago and there's a robot priest in the corner that you can go and talk to and everybody's like, yeah, that's how it is. Yeah, no, I mean, that's my experience too, is they have this way of blending technology with culture that I don't necessarily see in the United States. Yeah. I see it in some places, but technology seems more alien to it in the United States for some reason. It's something different. It's something alien to broader culture. I mean, with exceptions like in California and yeah. techno pagans and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. How do you see this coming decade shaping our civilization? Because this, what we are going through right now this year, it seems like a dent to our civilization and the sense of certainty. And big changes are coming, seems like it. How do you see it? I see it that like every 50 years we get a revolutionary period. Mm. Now I hear your dog is that back there. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the last round was in the late 60s. And before that, around, you know, 1917. And then you go back, I suppose, uh, 1848. And so, you know, basically twice a century we get into these revolutionary periods. And then, you know, people onboard new ideas. You get these conflicts. I think they're healthy conflicts. Well, I mean, I, I need to be careful. I mean, it, they're not always healthy conflicts. Sometimes they lead to, like, gen massive scale genocide. I know exactly what you mean. I totally agree with you, big picture-wise. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so things... Yeah, we're seeing a lot of changes. And, you know, right now I'm spending a lot of time in the uh, decentralized finance little subculture of 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 um, the cryptocurrency business. And these are the people that are basically building platforms that are going to eliminate banks. They're going to eliminate insurance companies. They are going to eliminate lending institutions. They are going to eliminate uh, um, money, the money transfer. You want business. to mention the name of some of them? Is XRP one of them? No. XRP is not really decentralized. It, it's yeah, it's the evil. It's the evil. One. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because what they they sold their soul and they're like providing a platform for transferring information between big banks. Right. So. Uh, all right. Let me let, let, let's start with um, everyone knows Bitcoin. Yes. Um, and then the second one people might know is Ethereum. Yes. And the coin is called ETH. And what is interesting about Ethereum is that what, it, well, let me start with Bitcoin. If you think of Bitcoin as being this ledger that we all share, it's all over the world, we can see who has what or what account number has what. So it's this giant shared ledger. And if you think about it, what it does is it gives us a way 
of keeping track of money, doing the function of, uh, that a bank does with that, and also allows it, us to transfer money. So it, it, takes, it eliminates one institution of human trust. Centralized right? So that's trust. the key thing. Absolutely. Centralized trust, yeah. uh, typically involving a big corporation or a big bank like Chase or J.P. Morgan Chase or whatever. Now, what, uh, the, when Ethereum came along, this kid who was then 18 years old named Vitalik Buterin. Uh, who I met in once Toronto. in Toronto. You met him? I met him once. You, we used to, I used to co-organize uh, Toronto transhumanist meetups. Yeah. And I came across this man, um, <clears throat> Corey something. He passed away, unfortunately. He was one of the early investors in Ethereum. And they uh -huh. had this place called Decentral on Sp uh, Spadina and King. And we were, you know, I just stopped by to see the place and he invited us to organize it there. And Vitalik was there. And this is like a year before Ethereum was released and really quickly yeah. just said hi, shook his hand. And that was it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you should listen to his podcast. Oh, if you could get him on. He's amazing. Like you look, if you look at some of the podcasts he does, he's very kind of somewhat robotic in style yes. but everything he says is like gold. i would love yeah. to have him yeah absolutely yeah um so uh and i actually got in on there I, I mean i had some bitcoin i was bitcoin mining at the time and then i i read about this project and it said well like if you send us a bitcoin we'll give you two thousand eths I said, all right, what the hell? Because like a Bitcoin was not worth anything at the time. <laughs> it was like, you know, I was like, OK, so it was like $250. I said, what the hell? I get said $250, I get 2,000 ETH. And um, because the project sounded amazing, because the idea is just as you can record this information uh, on a Bitcoin blockchain, and it's there, the whole history of this ledger is there for everyone to look at, set in stone. Uh, Vitalik pointed out that, well, you know, I can encode any amount of information. I'm going to build a blockchain where you could encode enough information so that you could encode in any computer program. Yeah, tokenize now, everything, that, basically. Uh, tokenize everything. Right. And not only that, but you could activate these things. Right. So you could have, so we could build a contract that would execute itself, right? Smart we wouldn't, you wouldn't need, right. So there you go. You don't need an organization of trust. Yeah in order to hold the money for us or even make sure that the contract is executed it just automatically gets executed and given that you know it is his the language is as we say turing complete any contract that you can write that's computable can be put into the blockchain and um you know people for the i guess ethereum just had its fifth birthday a, a couple weeks ago and it's taken some time for it to find its feet, but right now there is a segment of, of crypto called decentralized finance or DeFi in which people are now taking these tools and they are really going to town with these tools and really doing things like issuing loans. People are now putting mortgages on the blockchain. Uh, people are um, engaged in, well, I, you know, obviously fancy things like um, futures and futures markets and so forth, uh, insurance. So uh, the thinking is that, um, you know, eventually people are going to wake up to the idea that we don't, we don't need to pay some middleman to sit in a big fancy bank, you know, in a giant building on Fifth Avenue to do all this stuff and to hold our money and to invest that money in a carbon bubble or the military industrial complex or anything like that. You and I and all of our friends and people like us can just in, submit small amounts of money into these contracts. And then we basically build our own hedge fund, for example. And we, and we have like computers that are doing arbitrage for us. We don't need big fancy companies to do that. And so just as you don't see a Tower Records anymore, you know, you don't have to go to Tower Records to buy music. Uh, you don't, it's very rare to see uh, um, giant bookstores these days, right? You buy all that stuff on Amazon. Uh, Lord willing, these, uh, these uh, corporations giant banks, 
giant insurance companies, they're all going to go the way of tower records as well. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> I um I had just briefly I had John McAfee on. Uh, I like saw that. I saw ago. that interview. Yeah, uh, that was hilarious. That yeah. was a trip. <laughs> I, know, I bet it was. Yeah, I bet it was. I was like, he was. Yeah, he. Yeah, well, I, was, I was. I was. I was amazed that you were able to get in a word edgewise though, because he he'll keep rolling. Oh yeah, yeah. he just go. And in the beginning, he was like, just so you know, I, I keep drinking throughout the interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, all right. He was completely lit up. <laughs> <laughs> so his yeah, thing, uh, his yeah. uh, his thesis was that Bitcoin is going to go down and will do any other cryptocurrency that does not have anon uh, anonymity into it. So oh. I think he has a new coin. Um, I'm not Monero. recommending Monero. it or anything. He said Monero. Yeah. Ghost also is something that he, I think he has developed himself or with a bunch of people he's been backing. Mm. But Monero, he because of anonymity part of it. So, but I guess that I goes back to what, libertarianism. That's more important to him than it is yeah. to us. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, uh, well, that'll be interesting. That's entirely possible. That's entirely possible. Um, in, in which case, yeah, these these coins that occlude that do a better job of mixing up the transactions. Yeah. So, for example, when it, right now it's very easy to decipher our transactions using Bitcoin. Because, you know, here's an account. It went from me to this account and people figure out it's, you know, they figure out it's mine. They figure out it's yours. And pretty soon they re can reconstruct a network. But yeah. when you get to things like Monero, it's basically mixing the transactions up. So, you know, you don't really know who it's coming from or who it's going to. Excellent. Well, Peter, this was awesome. Um, I was looking forward to this conversation. I yeah. definitely didn't uh, disappoint. Uh, what yeah. is next for you and where can our audience follow your work? Uh, you mentioned you were working on two projects. Yeah, let's see. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have it. Do I have any? Well, you in your notes, just put my um, uh, I, I have some basic website, you know, okay. um, that just keeps track of the, the basic stuff. Um, and I've just created a new twitter account and, and again my extended mind is kind of offline here right now so i don't exactly so let's just, just have people start there and they you know they know how to use the internet they can find me <laughs> <laughs> excellent let me ask you um, I, I actually look for you on twitter because the final product you've seen my podcast i, yeah. I, I put the twitter handle on the bottom i couldn't find yours uh, i think yeah. i found a post from a couple of years ago but your account was deleted so i'm gonna add that to the notes after the show um yeah i think my up. the twitter account i'm using right now and it's brand new so i have like 10 followers so you yeah. guys can help me out with this yeah, for sure. let me see i think it's e wait i'm gonna check right now sure uh but the, the name is ej spode as in letter e letter j spode s-p-o-d-e and i'm just checking here right now to see if uh there is some underscore involved in that um ej underscore spode it's also i have a couple papers online um under that under that pseudonym as well uh if um I have a, a book review um, of The Kingdom of Language by Tom Wolfe and uh, uh, a paper, actually it's on Ethereum and this issue of trust mm -hmm. and the limits of uh, decentralized trust uh, and a couple other papers under that name. But I, like I've just fired up this, this Twitter account, EJ underscore Spode. Yeah, tell your, tell your, Tell your listeners or watchers to add it. So I have, it's really embarrassing because I only have like, what, 10 followers at this point. Well, and Rome wasn't built overnight, so. <laughs> uh, no, it was not. Let me ask you uh, the final question I ask all my guests, yeah. that if you come across an intelligent alien from a different civilization, what would you say is the worst thing humanity has done? And what would you say is our greatest achievement? See, 
I need to watch your podcast to the very end <laughs> because then I would be prepared for this. Well, I'm glad you didn't because uh, uh, just getting caught off guard is one of uh, one of the best moments of each episode. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So it's it's the it's the best and worst of humanity. That's what that's what I have to explain to this yes, alien. Uh huh. Well, I think that uh, the worst thing is that we imagine ourselves as being somehow above the natural realm and that we are somehow alien to the natural realm or we're somehow different from it. Um, and maybe that's also the best thing because it means we're, we're, we're questioning who we are and even if we're getting it wrong, and even if we're thinking we're special in a way that we're not, I mean, at least we're asking the question. So, you know, the best thing is also the worst thing. And let the alien ponder that and sort it out. <laughs> awesome. <laughs>